Okay, great. Thank you, Anna. Um, our third and final case study for uh, this morning, uh, I'd like to introduce senior lecturer Christina Doe from the University of, or sorry, from Curtin University, and also Dr. Andrew Brennan, also a senior lecturer at Curtin University. Uh, their case study is entitled Students as Partners, Co-Creation of Curricula Model, Enhancing the Learning Experience Through Assessment Rubric Design with Students and for Students. And I love the, the play of the prepositions there with students and for students. Okay, um, without further ado, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Ron. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Anna. Uh, we know we're the last presentation um, between you and lunch, so we'll try to um, work through it as quickly as possible. Um, but before we do that, um, we would like to begin um, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which Kern University is based, in which we have the privilege of uh, living and learning and raising our respective families, the Wajak Noongar Bungat Buja. And we'd like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And in the same token, we'd also like to acknowledge that this is stolen land um, that was never ceded. Yeah, and I'd like to just say Kaya Wanju, which means hello and welcome in the Woodchuck uh, from the Noongar uh, land that they, are, that they owned. And, and uh, I'm also just a quick side note. I'm from the northern suburbs of Perth, the city of Wanneroo, which means the place of the, the digging stick or place of the stick. Wana means stick. So... Uh, and I love the, the 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 history there. Amazing, so wonderful. Oh yes, and so just to let you know, we're an uh, interdisciplinary team, as you can see. We've got economics, uh, law here. Uh, we're just two members of our team. But also, we have so you can see their nursing and marketing and international linkages. And basically, we got together in 2021. I thank you very much to a Curtin Academy uh, Academy grant that we received with some money attached to this. And it was difficult times, you know, during COVID, those sort of challenging times, we had to meet online, et cetera, like we are now, but in, it, was, it was worse back then. But it was a, mainly a mentoring uh, relationship between staff uh, as a primary focus. But then it led into students as partners approach as it evolved, which we'll talk about in a, uh, shortly. So that was the cool thing. It started off some focus groups and then it led into students as partners. And of course, we received ethics approval for this. Um, we won't go into too much detail about the literature student as partners, as um, a lot of the presentations have already covered um, what students as partners is, and I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with the concept of students as partners. Um, based on our project, our project initially started focusing on mentoring, like Andrew had said earlier, but with the focus on really assessment rubrics and the, the design of assessment rubrics. Um, but what we found throughout as the project evolved over time was that facilitating student as partners arrangement is a meaningful way to facilitate an inclusive space to empower student voices and to incorporate students' perspectives with respect to shaping the university experience. Um, in particular, our case study highlights the benefits of inc incorporating students' perspectives and voice into, student, um, into assessment rubric design itself. Yeah. And I forgot to mention our main love was for rubrics. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's mentoring one another, encouraging one another, and a love for rubrics. And so that's where we kind of began 2021, as we mentioned. And then we ran these focus groups where we had our economics staff and students and nursing staff and students and law staff and students and some in Dubai too, the students there, to get, like a, get them together, run down some theory on rubrics, how we've utilised them, and then get them to critique and provide some insights on existing rubrics. But then it sort of ended. We got the, the data, we're happy with that. Uh, so that was good, like a typical focus group, but one cool thing led to another was one particular student uh, in the law uh, focus group made this critical insight and comment. She wanted, wanted to be more a, a part of this, this, this as a partner, student as partner type thing here. Yeah. So she really wanted to be more consulted in these sort of things. How can it um, go further? And how can we incorporate students? In other words, you see real, uh, what's the word, tangible uh, result. So that was our main driver, the result of our incorporating student feedback and seeing tangible result shortly thereafter. So that's the main drive now. As, and, and have we had these two different units we've identified, first year units, a law one, economics one. And lastly, and then we're just doing some disseminations, conferences, those sort of things. So yeah, that's how it's evolved, quite, quite cool. And thank you for that student. Oh yeah, and also, so we, we start off with saying hello, 
can we get you to come along to this workshop? Hence the call of interest. This is what it looked like, just a brief sort of overview. So in other words, we're targeting, so just get the sequence, quite important. Uh, we, we, we went to approach second and third year students who have done this first year unit and we approached them before the semester started. And then we went through the rubric and got their critical feedback as it were. So it makes sort of sense. So they, 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 they come in, give the feedback on the rubric that was used in the past semester that they're very familiar with, the second and third year's opinions and, and perspectives and, and critical evaluation. And then we implement a change during that semester one. And so Tina's gonna talk about her law one, and then I'll come back later on and talk about the economics one. So that's how it all sort of worked out. Um, what we would like to note is that for this pilot project, particularly with the Law um, Student as Partners workshop, we did manage to obtain student volunteers from a diverse group. Um, for example, there was diversity with respect to gender, age, academic performance, university engagement and life experience. Um, we do acknowledge that while there was a degree of diversity um, in this particular Student as Partners workshop, um, it was not necessarily a result of our conscious doing. Um, it just happened to be that way. And as a result of those who volunteered and, and responded to the, the, the call of interest. Um, in order to ensure diversity in a student as partners arrangement, such as the, the uh, our model that we adopted, um, we believe that facilitators do need to be mindful to ensure that different student groups are represented. Um, and this is something that we need to focus on and think more of in the future when we implement this model again. Um, but to uh, so to, just to talk a little bit more about the model that we adopted, as um, Andrew said earlier, we did send out a call of interest. Students did volunteer. Um, it was for a two-hour workshop, and um, in the in the call, we did say that it would be conducted by an academic facilitator. It was catered, and students will be um, given a a voucher um, in exchange for their time. So to start off the workshop, we really thought it was important that students understood what we're trying to achieve with respect to this project. The first thing that we did was we opened the workshop, obviously telling the students about the human um, ethics clearance and declaration, and we obtained their formal consent to be involved in the project. Um, following that, we explained to the students the importance of ensuring the graduate capabilities promoted by the university are indeed embedded into their courses and through the process of constructive alignment to the corresponding um, units, and in particular, as it's regulated by the Higher Education Standards Framework Threshold Standards. We then spent a lot of time talking about the unit itself that we're creating the assessment rubric for, because it was fundamentally important that the students understood the, the task that we were doing. So we spoke about the unit, where it sat in the course, and the unit learning outcomes that this particular assessment was seeking to assess. And then after that, we got straight into it. So the formalities was only a very small portion of the workshop itself. What we really wanted to do was spend a lot of time facilitating the actual rubric design and having students engage in the process of designing um, the, the rubric itself. Perfect. So look, I can only speak for myself, but when I first started this workshop, I thought all that we'd be doing was changing the language in the descriptors and the different levels of performance um, within the assessment rubric itself. And while it certainly started off this way, as you can imagine, given that this was a workshop um, coordinated by a law academic and a lot of students who volunteered were indeed law students, it became more of a um, fiery negotiation and the students happily volunteered a lot of suggestions as to how these particular rubrics could be improved. And these are some of the, the, the suggestions that were made and that were ultimately implemented. So this workshop was really interesting because a lot of the times the students would make suggestions and in real time, the facilitator myself, I would um, incorporate the, the, um, the suggestions immediately in real time so that way the students could see it being implemented. Um, what we do have is we have a short video from a student, um, Ryan Kirby, who is a Bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Commerce student, also is the Faculty of Business Law um, student union rep um, who was involved in the workshop. He delivered a quick script to camera uh, explaining about the, his experience in the workshop. This workshop required of us as students aspects of ideation and a sharing of perspectives. This setting allowed for us as students to challenge traditional structures of regulation in regards to assessment policy within the tertiary education environment. Top-down regulation and regimented policies are normative in these settings and often these conventional approaches characterised by rigid regulations fall short in promoting students' interests and fostering their critical engagement with both the discipline material and the assessment frameworks themselves. 
The workshop involved aspects of design thinking and radical collaboration. Of note, suggestions made by students as partners participants were incorporated in real time to encourage robust discussion and feedback. This structure allowed for an equal and democratic input. Nobody got all they wanted, but nobody got nothing. The redesign of an assessment rubric in collaboration with engaged and active students has distinct merit as it enhances student engagement with the course material, incorporates student input in assessment design, and in turn improves student receptivity, promotes student empowerment, and champions diversity. This workshop oh. required... Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, we we assure you, Ryan, um, we did not script that script at all. He, he, he wrote it himself and delivered it to camera um, just last week prior to him taking off to, to do a study exchange in Morocco. So, um, yeah, really powerful words from Ryan there about his experience. And here what you can see on the screen is the direct impact of incorporating student voice and perspective into assessment rubric design. Um, what you'll notice on the, the screen, the left-hand side, or my left at least, um, was the rubric that was used prior to the workshop and the rubric now that subsequently um, has been used um, as a virtue, as a result of the student as partners workshop. Um, you can see the suggestions that the students made, including the criteria descriptor within the rubric itself, using color um, uh, to demonstrate the levels of um, performance. Um, one of the ones that the students really pushed for was having feedback instead of holistic feedback right at the end of the rubrics, instead ensuring that the, the feedback is targeted to each assessment criterion. And those are some of the suggestions that the students really um, pushed for and um, we were able to facilitate. Um, one of the other suggestions that the students were really vocal about was that they really wanted to have an example of an exemplar that was in the 80 plus range. Um, a lot of them were pushing for this because a lot of the students said, that, well, they want to know what they need to do in order to get a good mark or the best mark. And I, I tend to be really hesitant in providing the exemplars just because I feel as though it diminishes critical thinking, stifles innovation and problem solving. But what we came out of that, that student as partners workshop, that discussion, was that students just wanted to really see that rubric in application. So as a compromise, as a part of the negotiation process, um, we decided that instead of re releasing full exemplars of an example of the assessment, we would instead re release bite-sized videos, examples of each criterion at each end of the rubric spectrum. So what you can see on the screen here is um, the example of the presentation criterion, oh, sorry, presentation um, structure, sorry, criterion, one at um, the 50% mark, an example at the 80% mark. Um, these, again, these resources were um, created in real time really quickly. So after the workshop, a week later, the, the, these um, short videos were scripted, they were recorded and implemented into the, the unit Blackboard site um, for that following semester, as, as well as the, with the rubric, so the way the students could use the um, assessment rubric and apply it. So this all happened in semester one of this year, and we we're able to then um, roll out the, the rubric, the, the video supplementary materials, and we were able to survey the students who were enrolled in the unit and subsequently had to use this assessment rubric. Um, we had a response rate of 66.8% of students completing, um, of completing the survey. What was really interesting and was particularly of note was that no students indicated that they did not understand the assessment rubric. 99.2% of students indicated that they understood the assessment rubric, now admittedly to varying degrees. 12% indicated that they understood some of the rubric. 35.2% indicated that they understood majority of the rubric and 52% understood the whole rubric itself. Um, there's a lot more data um, that, we're, that we, we did, we were able to collate, but for the nature of this um, presentation, we won't go into it to too much detail. This is just demonstrates and one example of how powerful incorporating student voice can be in assessment rubric design because it allows students to actually better understand the task at hand. And now Andrew's oh, yeah. going to talk about um, his experience implementing a similar model in yeah. economics. I'll be relatively brief, so you can have lunch soon. But thanks, Tina. Yeah, so good. So I was so inspired by the the law uh, avenue that they did and the, the feedback I heard about what they did in the workshops. I was really excited. So I thought for a unit I teach, I'm involved in, which is a common core unit 
So they're always tricky, which means students have to do it. In the Bachelor of Commerce, it's called Markets and Legal Framework, and it's a it's a consists of economics, law, and marketing all amalgamated into one. And I, I teach the economics portion. And so one of our assessments is called this so-called economics principles analysis over there on the left. That's the original uh, rubric. So then we we got the students in just just before this assessment was released in semester two this semester. So we've got some economics third year and second year students and, uh, who attended to the call of interest. And we got them to critique and have a workshop together. This is what they come up with. <clears throat> Pretty interesting. So just a quick side note, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, interacting with our students, getting their insights, because you just realise one's age and one's sort of lack of knowledge in trying to, you think, oh, look at my Rubik's, the world's best, but then you realise it's not. So that was cool. Just a quick sort of important point. So the important point is that academic is we don't get a chance really to spend time with students to explain what we do and why we do it. So this is a great time to say, look, students, this is what I do already. Is it good enough? And so I said, for example, this we have a video guide on this assessment. And you can see on the right-hand side there my horrible writing and highlighting. And, and I actually go through the assessment piece uh, and record a video with annotations. So they felt that was useful. And, of course, I forgot. When I'm doing that, I'm linking back to, not this one, but to the new rubric that they designed, yeah? So as they're doing the video, link it back. So it's really important. They're also happy with the, the exemplars of the tutor. Uh, the tutor sort of working out, okay, and explaining in class, here's a, a way of answering a particular economics problem. This is what you need to do to get a HD, high distinction. This is what characterises a good answer. So rather than providing a written exemplar separate, the tutor in class, and keep it more in-house to avoid, you know, AI, you know, leaking, leakage, as it were, Gen AI taking over things, uh, you've got the tutor sort of sorting things out. So they're the exemplar. And, of course, the lecturer too, as, a, as an example. Now, other key comments, more positives, and then we get the negative at the end. They wanted more colour, so that was good. Uh, and we sorted that out. I'll show you in a second. But lastly, I thought this was a really insightful insight, and it left and I radically changed things. So TLDR, too long, don't read it. I didn't realise. I had everything in one document. That was too much for the student. They said, look, it's just too much. No one's going to read it. No, oh, we can't spend ages on it. Not interested. So then I, they asked me to separate things, divide it up, Make it much cleaner, crisper. Look at that. It's just quite it's like, oh, so much text. It turned off. I didn't know. So that was good. And so here's the end result. You've got on the left-hand side a lovely sort of fruit salad rubric. How could you not want to attend, attempt this assessment? It's just so delicious. <laughs> and then on the right-hand side there, you've got sort of more specificity on how marks are allocated. And I had this in my video guide and everything so they could link into it. So students could clearly see what an exemplary HD mark is versus, say, a meets expectations, and then the corresponding uh, overall sort of a judgment and assessment. They knew exactly uh, what they, they needed to do to do well and made just to get through it, perhaps, and how to fail if they really wanted to, but hopefully not. So that's the general gist. We'll finish up now with a couple of uh, things we're going to talk about. Just, just one, I'll just name one thing because Tina mentioned it beforehand. She talked about how, you know, when you do the call for interest, you tend to attract the high achieving student. Like we, we, we really did try. We got gender diversity. That was really good. A mixture of uh, different genders. That was very useful. But we didn't really have sort of maybe lower uh, on the scale of achievement students because I knew those students personally from the economics one. <laughs> They're very good students. So we got that sort of perspective and perceptions on, on the rubric redesign. But we didn't hear from other students. So that's something where we could improve for the future. That will be my main comment. Mm. Excellent. Yeah. No, that's it from oh, us. Okay, great. Yeah, so we can we can take some questions from the floor if there are any, uh, and happy to do so. Great, thank you so much. I love the fact that uh, work it, more work is being done on assessment. I'm a big David Bowd fan, and I think that uh, not only is is some of assessment important but formative and i love the uh, involvement of students in this very student-centered are there any questions either online or on the floor so thank you to both tina and andy sorry uh, for the informality i'm just reading your your uh your <clears throat> titles there okay while we're waiting i have a question um one issue that that might be uh, asked is with student involvement in their own assessment, was there a, tr a trend or did you notice any? And I suppose subsequently um, in analytics, did you find that the assessment task was actually made easier so that students could get better marks? 
No, I, I don't, not from the workshops that we conducted. A lot of the comments were more constructive about how can we make the information in the assessment rubric more easily understood by students. So um, I think that was the main focus. And I think the students also adopted the same focus as well. Yeah, definitely not on the assessment piece, but it kind of made it easier in the indirect sense because we had, we gained much more clarity, or at least I did my economics one. So in other words, it was less text for them to, to sort of sort their through in their mindset. So in that respect, it was somewhat easier, but not in a direct sense to make it easier to pass as it were. But the student, we would make sure they, the student has to work hard. And that's what came through the, our, the economics workshop. Mm. I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to work hard to get my HD. And that's still the case too. Yeah. Oh, that's great. It, it sounds like it was made better as opposed to easier. Oh. Absolutely. <laughs> Something that came out of the lawship workshop was that they wanted more, they wanted us to be a lot more prescriptive. So, for instance, with content, they said, well, say how many cases we need to refer to, say how many journal articles, say how many pieces of legislation, and because um, they wanted that, that 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 level of detail, whereas that's where I push back as the academic a little bit more, saying, no, again, we don't want to stifle innovation. We, it's too hard to dictate exactly the number of um, references that need to be made with respect to that particular question, because each question was different for each student. So we it was a lot more of a negotiation process to ensure that, um, I guess that, that that it was still academic. It was still academically rigorous. Mm, great. Are there any questions from the floor or or from our online participants? Please feel free to type them in chat or raise your hand for Anna. Thanks, Bree Jones, for the comment and the love heart. Who put the love heart? That's great. <laughs> wow. I, I think it was David Bout himself who said something to the lines of. Um, Students can can endure bad teaching, but they can't do so with bad, poor assessment. And so I think um, when we look at making assessment better, whether it be formative or summative, and when we make it more transparent and less sort of holistic and subjective as rubrics do, it's a it's a great win win for everyone. As a as a teacher and as a an academic in past life, I know it's a lot easier to mark with with um, with rubrics because of the the uh, everything's visible and everything's clear. And as a student as well, it's a lot easier to to not have the guesswork involved. Well, there's a question. Oh, we have a question. Uh, I'll just I'll just read it for Daniel. Did the university need to change their overall assessment guide to allow new tasks from cosine code sign? Sorry. Um. No. No, we didn't. Um, I, before we uh, embarked on this task, we did get the um, human ethics clearance and we also um, discussed it with our respective directors of learning and teaching within our schools. Um, and there was no requirement to have any change, the overall assessment guide itself. Um, this is why we also think assessment rubric design is a good place for student as partners because a lot of courses these days are really heavily regulated and prescribed um, so it doesn't get leave I feel academics with a lot of scope for including innovation and including um, innovation that's led by students whereas the way in which we provide feedback and assessment feedback doesn't tend to be overly prescriptive um, so for that reason we, we believe that student as part of initiatives can really be incorporated in this space. And of course, the benefits are that students can better understand what's required of them when they're completing the assessment task, but ultimately the feedback that they do receive um, after they complete the task so that they wait, they can ultimately improve and implement that feedback for future assessments. No, and I think we've got a lot of flexibility for some reason to work on our assessments and to modify them as long as it's just done before the due, the due date, I suppose, of the mm. semester starting point. I don't know, that could work for its negative as well. But in terms of positive, uh, we, we could implement things relatively quickly uh, for, for the economics and law things. So that was really a major benefit. So, yeah, we could we could, we did, we could just, just do it. So thanks for the flexibility. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I just have a quick question. So when it came to obviously you've run the focus groups from there you had some really interesting students continued with your uh, collaboration and co-creation how did you close the feedback loop there so you've had some students that were in the focus group stage did they get to hear about where their feedback was implemented in um, in the final result and how did you go about that 
Absolutely. It happened in real time. So in the workshop, um, the students, we we conducted in a seminar room. So we had the computer at the front. It was projected on the screen. Every time the students made a suggestion, um, the facilitator or myself, I would say, oh, look, you mean like this? And I would implement it immediately. They were able to see it in real time. Those students who attended the workshop, um, once we finalised the, the rubric, they were able to see it. And then before we formally released it, again, students were Make, given the offer if they wanted to see the rubrics or cast their eyes over one last time to see if there was any further feedback that they um, would like to see incorporated. So that's how we, we closed the loop. They were able to see it in real time right then and there and then um, obviously when we implemented it. Yeah, and for the economics one, I just sent them my rubric adjustments, all the things that hopefully incorporate all their feedback just to say, look, are you happy with this? And they were happy. So that was, that was a bonus. Mm. And no, Great. Uh, I think that the some amazing questions and some equally uh, excellent answers. I'd want uh, another question, if I might. Um, often in in assessment, there is the it's no longer a debate, but uh, there's often a discussion between norm base versus criteria base, and clearly a rubric uh, would be in the criteria base. Um, now, I'm not speaking to any university uh, in specific, but um, in those discussions, it's sometimes said that. Uh, uh, faculties like law tend to be ba old bastions of the old um, norm-based uh, assessment. Um, did you find uh, in, in either of, of, of the trials that there were any sort of pushback against the, the criteria-based as opposed to norm-based assessment? No, not from these two particular case studies. We, we didn't notice any pushback with that respect from, from the two cohorts. Can you think of anything, Andy? No, not, no, 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 no major pushbacks or queries like those sort of things. No. no. So, at least from the economics, nothing from law. No. Oh, there you go. All oh, good. Okay, great. It, it, it sounds that uh, criteria based. Uh, is well entrenched and, and I think a lot of people myself included would, would say that's a great thing yes um, okay are there any other questions at all I know we are are running over time so uh, if there aren't any other questions I would just uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Brennan and and uh, Miss Miss Doe for their uh, wonderful presentation on this very important uh topic. I know sometimes people think assessment is dry and they've certainly proven that it isn't. It's vital and very important. Thank you again. Thank, thank you, Ron. Yeah, thank you, everyone else. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Um, for